Welcome back to Forbidden Knowledge News. I'm your host, Chris Matthew. Today, my guest is Rob Sullivan. First, just a couple of announcements. If you'd like to help with our film fundraiser, we have links in the description. Anything is greatly appreciated. You can also help support Forbidden Knowledge News by watching the Forbidden Documentary Occult Louisiana, available on Tubi and multiple streaming platforms. Also, get yourself a Rockfin Premium membership at rockfin.com slash FKN+. You'll get access to all our premium content and all the premium content from every creator on Rockfin. Today, I want to welcome Rob Sullivan. He is a cancer survivor, author, and public speaker. Rob, welcome. How you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me on your show. Thanks so much for coming on. I really look forward to hearing about your journey of spiritual awareness and how the worst news you can get in your life actually turned out to be a real blessing for you. And your work brings much inspiration to people. I love what you're doing. But this is your first time on, so tell us just a little bit about yourself and the work you're doing. Sure. I'll give you a little background. I... Uh, I'll... What's relevant is I grew up in downtown Chicago. My dad is a, a physician at Northwestern Memorial. So the, when it comes to, you know, what we're going to be talking about today, that's an important factor because, you know, being one of, you know, six kids and having immediate access to some of the best healthcare professionals in the world, going down the alternative medicine path was not something that was, it wasn't the first line of defense. Let's put it that way. Uh you know, and so that was, in fact, everything that we're going to talk about is really, you know, in terms of the work that I'm doing, which is really, when I look back on it, it's really wild. It's not anything I was ever raised to believe, but it's stuff that I've come to embrace. And that's I, I, the real key element. And I love the fact that even my dad, uh, he was super supportive of all that. He didn't look at me and think, you know, wow, you know, take the crack pipe out of your mouth. What are you doing? You know, he was just like, go for it, you know? And so we'll, we'll, we can talk about, you know, how that all played out, but that's a, a sort of a bit of a thumbnail about some of the key signposts along the way. Excellent. Well, tell us a little bit about, before we get into your story, what is it that you are doing now? Tell us a little bit about your work. Sure. Uh, my work is uh, in a couple of different areas. I do on the, you know, what pays the bills largely is I do a lot of corporate training. So I lead workshops on uh, a lot of sales training. I do work in presence and energy. I have a workshop on listening uh, because most people, although they may admit that they're not great listeners, have never actually had a class in how to do it better. Uh, so I teach that. And, you know, lots of different things like that. I have a couple of partners that I work with on some of those projects, uh, partnered with a guy named Barry Von Zale, who is a drummer uh, from Johnny Clegg's band. Johnny Clegg is a really famous uh, South African musician. And uh, Barry and Johnny played together for 19 years, something like that, uh, before Barry started doing more, uh, you know, went to business school and got involved with people like me. Right on. Well, tell us a little bit about your journey and what brought you to where you're at on your path. Yeah, the where I'm at on my path, let's start there, is uh, recently I put out a book called The Trek Within, uh, Embracing Unexpected Truths. And what where that came from, it was literally 10 years in, in the works. Uh, it was nothing I ever expected to write, but I realized that the the business writing and stuff that I did, that you know, people always responded well to. Nobody ever really responded emotionally to it. Uh, but when I started sharing some of my journey, people were like, "Wow, you know, thank you for opening up." And so the very first part of it was uh, back in 1993, 94. I had left uh, Leo Burnett. I was working at an ad agency in Chicago, and I went to become an options trader at the Chicago Board of Trade. While I was there, I got diagnosed with narcolepsy, which is a, a sleep disorder. And, you know, of course, you know, when when the problem first developed, my dad sent me to the neurologist that he knew. And I went through sleep studies and I did all this to make a very long story short. Uh, at the end of a year of trying all kinds of different medications and genetic testing, they said, you have all the genes for narcolepsy. Uh, you're going to be on Ritalin and Prozac for the rest of your life. And by the way, drink more coffee. And I said, nothing to do it. You know, you may as well just throw your hands up and say, you don't know what the hell you're talking about because I'm not going to do that. Um, and so I said, okay, Western medicine does not have a cure. I'm going to find one um, because there are, my dad always said, 
you know, the the people in the rainforests and the Chinese and, you know, medicine herbalists and stuff, he's like, they've been doing this for thousands of years. We're naive if we don't think we can learn from them. And I always love that about my dad. In fact, one of the people that I went to along the way was a medical intuitive. And my dad was so taken by my experience with her that he had an appointment with her. And then he started sending patients to her. And she told me later, her name was Shen. Uh, she said, Rob, your dad is the only Western physician to ever send me a patient. That's great. Yeah, so yeah. I'm really proud of him. He had, I had great support in that way. And uh, that journey, which involved medical intuitives, uh, Chinese herbalists, acupuncturists, uh, finally ended when I found a ninth generation Japanese healer in New York by the name of Jay Atacama. Jay passed away a year or two ago, but he actually might have been even a little longer, but he was the one who cured me of narcolepsy, something that Western medicine said couldn't be done. And I will never forget his assistant, Gail, was working on me. And this is the most mind blowing thing that's ever happened to me physically, I think. She was, it was like the third treatment. And, and, you know, it was one of those things, it, it was much like Reiki, where it's a hands on thing and they put their hand on you. And the sessions were usually only about 15 minutes long. In this particular session, I was sitting in a chair upright and she put her hand right on my sternum. And the minute her hand touched me that day, I, will, I kid you not, I thought every cell in my body was on fire. I started sweating profusely. I thought I was going to pass out. It didn't hurt. It was just, just unbelievable energy. And then it just went, when she moved her hand away, it went away. And I looked at her and I said, what was that? And she said, she smiled. She was very understated. She's like, oh, yeah, I noticed that too. Like, you know, there had been a breeze in there. <laughs> no, no, no. What happened? Yeah. You know? And she goes, well, you know, I don't know. She said, I can't tell you exactly. She said, what I can tell you is... She said, I was treating your soul center. And she said, when my mother went through the treatment, this, what you just experienced was the turning point in her therapy. Now, her mother, it was the reason that I went to Jay in the first place. Her mother had rheumatoid arthritis so bad that she couldn't walk across a room. Jay cured her. She was playing tennis after she worked with Jay. Wow. And again, rheumatoid arthritis, not something that Western medicine says you can do much about. Uh, which is why I knew in my heart that Jay would be able to help me. And so that was the beginning of the journey. And that led to, you know, me doing some writing about what had happened and, you know, all of the Japanese or the Chinese herbal stuff that I, you know, remedies that literally ended up driving my roommates crazy because I had to concoct these teas and stuff like that. It smelled like rotting forest debris. But the... Um, you know, it was it was an incredible journey, but it ended with me being cured. And then fast forward uh, in 2015, I was diagnosed with lymphoma. And that was the biggest gift of all, uh, because, you know, my dad had told me later, he said, you know, when I was in medical school, he said that was a death sentence, what you had. And now they don't even use that word, uh, you know, remission. They use the word cure. He, you know, the doctor said straight up, he said, I can cure you of this. And of course, I mean, it was not fun. I went through 545 hours of inpatient chemo. Uh, and I'm not going to say it was a picnic, but it was not, it wasn't a bad thing. It was because you know, I realized and this is, this is like a huge spiritual awakening for me because I knew almost immediately. Now I was terrified. I got diagnosed on my 48th birthday and I, you know, there's nothing like a diagnosis like that to make you wonder, you know, am I going to uh, live to see my next birthday? Cause what they, what they told me uh, when the guy, when the doctor called up to tell me the results of the test, he said, you have tumors all around your neck. And he said, the primer <clears throat> tumor, excuse me, is uh, a five by seven by eight centimeter tumor that's sitting right on top of your heart. Uh, which is a pretty big tumor. And uh, and he said, we don't know what it is. It's one of two things, uh, but it's going to certainly require chemo and might require radiation. <laughs> and so that led on this incredible journey. But that was the, there was so much magic that happened uh, during that. I mean, I could go on and on about it, but it was the, the one of the biggest lessons I learned through that was about, and this is something I talk about in my workshops too, the, the power of our words that a lot of times we say things and there's a gap between what we say and what other people hear. Now, when it comes to cancer and tumors and things like that, you'll hear people say, you know, they're like, oh, I have cancer or whatever. I never said that, by the way, because have is a possessive word. You know, 
and you don't this is not a possession this is not something you're keeping and holding on to and if you use a word like that your body can end up being very literal so i had a, a friend who was going through chemo at the same time she and i talked about it and she gave me a much better way to think of it she said we are experiencing tumors you know just the way you experience a cold you know it's it's a temporary thing it's here for now you know and i and i realized i need to know what lessons you know, this came to teach me lessons. Mm -hmm. What are the lessons? Let me, and she used to say, you know, let's walk with it, learn from it and move on. And I love that whole concept because if you had told me that that's what I would be doing and how I'd be approaching it, I would have thought no way. And, and that was what ended up being very inspirational for people because even though at the beginning, my dad, my dad and mom were raised by depression era people. So they had a bit of a scarcity mentality. I mean, I love them very much obviously, but they, when it came to stuff like that, they were really worried. They're like, oh, don't tell anybody you have, you know, cancer because you're, you're going to, and see, I just use the word have, you know, uh, it's, it's that easy yeah. to do. Uh, don't tell anybody about the diagnosis because, you, may, you know, you might not get hired again. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, and at first I heard that, and then there was that moment of fear and panic. And, and then I'm like, wait a minute, I'm going to be bald in three weeks. This is not a secret. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I decided to be open about it. And and that took a lot for me because, you know, it's like raising your hand and saying, I'm sick, I can't do this by myself and I need help, which as a male is very emasculating. Uh, but people, the response was not, you know, oh, and, and, I, and I did it also because, because when you get into energy, people can look at you and, you know, if they look at you and they th think, oh, that's so sad that you're going through that and that's really pathetic and they visualize you checking out early, how horrible is that? You know, and the and the more secretive you know you are, the more likely that people might catastrophize on your behalf. Which is why I was like, nothing doing. I want you, I'm gonna get through this. I need you all the vision. You know, if you're inclined to do anything, I don't need gifts, I don't need anything, you know, but visualize this going away. And and that you know, and that and you know, visualize me learning from it and growing and it just you know, being done with. And that was really powerful. And it was amazing how many people followed the journey because I wrote about it. And a lot of that ended up in the book. And people, people I didn't even know were reading it, read it. You know, there's a group of what I call the silent supporters that like for months afterwards, I would bump into people on the street and they'd look at me and they'd say, I've been reading everything you've written. And these are people I had no idea they even knew that I was going through it. Yeah, and, and it was it had reached that many people. It blew my mind. So I've talked a lot, but it just gives you an idea. No, that's a, I get really excited. That's a, that's a great introduction cool. to your story. Now, more and more as a collective, we are starting to become aware of the flaws of our modern medical system. More and more, there is a growing understanding that a lot of the illnesses that we experience is coming from an energetic origin. And it starts within and then manifests as a physical symptom. Is this something that you'd agree with? Hello, friends. At some point in our journeys, we all need guidance and direction. One thing I've learned along the way is that there are many ways to connect with our soul mission. Jennifer Halcom offers over 30 years experience with intuitive tarot, life coaching, and energy and attachment clearing. She helps others with energetic blocks become aligned with their soul mission. She offers one-on-one -on -one or online Zoom sessions, and cases are assessed on an individual basis, and she works with everyone truly in need. You can email her now to set up a free consultation at jenniferhalcom at gmail.com or through Facebook Messenger. All those links are right in the description. Oh, totally. Okay. So here's, a, this is a wild moment in that journey. I was in the doctor's office and I very casually asked, like an investigative reporter, I said, you know, what's known about what causes these tumors? And the nurse, the doctor didn't say anything. And the nurse practitioner, her name was Betsy. She looked at me and she, her response really was weird. She looked at me and she's like, you didn't cause these. 
And I'm thinking to myself, that's a really interesting reaction because that wasn't the question that I asked you. But my immediate reaction to what she said is, I don't believe that's true. And here's why I, know, why I don't. Uh, that, and I'm not saying that everybody who has, you know, who experiences cancer, that they, uh, you know, cause their tumors necessarily. Uh, you know, there's Monsanto to thank for a lot of the things that are happening. But the, uh, you've got, you know, in my case anyway, a year before, I had met a woman and we had a, a bit of a whirlwind relationship and it, it looked really promising. And I was super excited about her. And long story short, that she ended up doing a disappearing act and that didn't go anywhere. And I was devastated. So emotionally, I circled the drain for about a year. And I'm not proud of that because, you know, how I don't blame her for that either, by the way. How I digest life is on me. But the point is, you can't have negative energy coursing through your veins for a long period of time and not expect that it's going to have consequences. It, you know, like, for example, if I have if I'm dealing with a sore throat or whatever, I know that that the congestion associated with that usually is a signal to me, um, not necessarily to anybody else, but it's signaled to me that there is a conversation that I need to have that I'm not having. In other words, you know, the words are trapped. Uh, now, in the case of the tumor. And think about the symbolism of that. There's this huge five by seven by eight centimeter tumor sitting on top of my heart. I mean, like how much more blatant could it be? You know, it, it was a heart related issue. I called it the love lymphoma connection. Uh, and it was one of those things that I get. And, and I do want to emphasize, I do not blame that woman for it. I mean, she and I are friends to this day. It's not a big deal. But the, that was on me. That was how I was doing it. So energetically, do I think that we're there? We play a role in that, hundred mm-hmm. percent. And more and more as well, we're discovering that energy is also a solution for this positive energy, our mindset, the way our perspective, the way we view things. And part of the problem on the medical side is you mentioned it a couple of times. Things that doctors say that we call medical hexing that makes you get into a certain mindset that this is going to be terminal, that there's no cure for something, that you can't get past certain things because that's what the medical books have always told us. So there's that aspect that causes a negative mindset in people, and it's sad that it comes from our own medical industry. Yeah, I I agree 100% because, you know, it's the the state of medicine is what do we know now what we know now is we might think you know at you know if somebody said you know at the moment we don't have a way to deal with this that okay but you know are you looking into it are you doing anything about it but to look at somebody and say this is the diagnosis you're going to be on ritalin and prozac for the rest of your life and drink more coffee and there's really nothing more that we can do for you i mean give me a break um and that's that's not an acceptable answer. Uh, in fact, in that moment, uh, you know, somebody with integrity should say Western medicine doesn't have a way to deal with this, but that doesn't mean there isn't one. I'd encourage you to do your homework. And here's a few things that you could do to start out. Right. Now, once we begin any type of spiritual journey, especially myself, and many others that I've spoken with about this start to notice synchromysticism in their life, synchronicities, things that connect emotions and physical events in their lives. And you were talking about the magic in the experience of going through the lymphoma and the curing process. Could you talk a little bit more about that and maybe if you experienced any synchronicities during that time period? Wow. Yeah, there's um, so much there. Uh, one of the key things was what I call laughing in the face of lymphoma, which was finding the humor and stuff. Because you know, you have a, we have a choice of what we focus on. We can sit there and catastrophize and go, oh my gosh, I'm dealing with this. And 
you know, I don't know what the outcome is going to be and blah, blah. And I'm not going to say I was a hero in the face of uncertainty. Uncertainty was one of the big lessons that I needed to learn both on the front end and the back end. Because there's even afterwards, there was uncertainty that led to, you know, three weeks after the chemo was over, I had robotic chest surgery to make sure that what was lighting up the scan was actually scar tissue and not the tumor. Um, and so I'm not going to sit there and pretend that I was handling that gracefully as you know, you know, the Buddha, I was not, uh, but the, the, um, but you know, the ability to laugh at things, you know, that was such a key part of it. And, and it does lead, you know, it's not necessarily the synchronicity part, which I'll touch on in a second, but the, you know, can you, can you find the humor and things like uh, my friend Ross joined me at the hospital for, for the very first treatment. He met me there. And we just had a very funny moment where there was a very inelegant test that needed to be performed. And, you know, and we were just looking at each other like, oh, my God. And afterwards, he put a little Facebook post about it. And he said, you know, what Rob described as a rather inelegant test, he said, I would describe as a hot uh, Saturday evening with a, a beautiful nurse, <laughs> which was hilarious. And so there were all these little moments like that. Like even when the doctor was like, he looked at me when it was clear that I was going through chemo or going for chemo. He said, he said, were you planning on having children? And I said, well, I don't know. That's a team sport under ideal circumstances. And he said, uh, he, and then he looked at me and he goes, okay, I'm going to have to get the people from urology up here because we're going to have to send you to the sperm bank and do all that kind of stuff so you can freeze some things and whatnot. So this young woman about 10 minutes later comes bounding into the room, like just a barrel full of energy. And she like goes into this whole description of like the freezing and all this stuff. And she, you could tell this woman just loved her job. And I looked at her and after she finished, she goes, she goes, what, you know, what do you, what are you thinking right now? How are you feeling about all this? And I looked at her and I said, well, I think it's funny, actually. I, I said, first of all, you have a, you have a, I could tell you love your job. I said, I, I, we got into a little discussion about that, but she's like, well, yeah, but that's fine. But what do you think about all this? And I said, well, I think it's funny, actually. And she's like, funny, what do you mean? I said, well, I spent my entire life trying to swim, teach them to swim backwards. And now you're telling me I have to pay for storage. And she's like, she burst out laughing and she goes, oh, good. You're not one of those people I'm going to have to worry about. I'm like, no, I'm not. Definitely. Um, but then, but it was because I was willing to do that and did not take, you know, things deathly seriously at every turn that, you know, beautiful things happen and people, you know, they weren't always like synchronicities, but like there were people who showed up in my life who were complete strangers who, you know, did, were just unbelievable angels in that whole period. Uh, there was a friend I hadn't seen in 20 years who flew in from Pittsburgh to take care of me one weekend that was supposed to be one of the, the tougher weekends. And, you know, she just was an incredible help. And so there were all these moments and things that like I couldn't have planned or anticipated, but the way that people rose to the occasion uh, you know, it's like you got to let yourself, you know, you got to put yourself in that position. Now, contrast that with uh, a friend of mine told me this, a really sad story. She was at a yoga class at the gym and there was a young or a, an older woman who had been in the class and there was a group of people. They always went to the same class. And then one day she goes to the class and where this woman sat, there was a, a, a yoga mat and a candle and they found out after the class that the woman had died of like brain cancer or something like that. She never told anybody she was going through it. And now I respect somebody's right to privacy at the same time, we are all connected. And so all of the people in that class walked away feeling like, and I'm getting a chill just telling us they felt like they had been robbed of the opportunity to help mm. because I do believe that people want to help. And I witnessed it personally, you know, with the people who came forward and there were people who didn't come forward, people I never heard from, but you know, I didn't keep a scorecard. It's not about that. What I realized is there's a lot of people who just don't know how to deal with it and their way of dealing with it is not dealing with it. That's on them. There's no judgment there, but it's the, the miracles are the people who you wouldn't expect, you know, the, um, and the, the different things that, that happen and, and the people who show up in your lives, you know, that's the miracle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's amazing how much a positive perspective and mindset can aid in healing anything in the human body. And I, and this is, I think, one of the missing pieces to our modern medical industry is that understanding. 
the past few years I'm encouraged because I see people starting to become aware of this and look at alternative medicines and healing methods and modalities again. And it's all because of this seeming wave of awareness that's come over us over the past few years. Is this something that you would agree with that we are becoming more aware of things? hundred percent. And so they, uh, let me give you another example. My life was saved about three years ago by a dream. Mm. And the doctors at the hospital were really blown away because I was very open about what happened. And the, in fact, the, the one doctor brought in an entire team of people to hear my story because they couldn't believe like what had happened. And so if you're open to it, yeah. I'll give you the background. On what happened. So, so I woke up one morning and I'd had this incredible dream. I can still picture it vividly. I was standing on the shore of the ocean and it was a very dark, almost Harry Potter like sky where uh, you could tell that there had just been a storm. And there's a lifeguard standing next to me who communicates to me telepathically. Now that's only happened to me twice in you know my life in a dream kind of state, because uh, usually it's not like that, but it got my attention. And he telepathically communicates. He said, don't be thrown off by the calm. It's going to get worse again before it gets better. And he turns around and he starts running at top speed. I thought, okay, if the lifeguard is running at top speed away from the shore, I better do the same, same thing. So I turn around and I start running. By the time I catch up to him, there's a wall. It's a 50 foot wall to my left. And it's the, you know those huge cinder block kind of things. And as I got to the wall, this wave crashes into the wall and the wave blocks about 90% of the water, but about 10% got through. So when I could see the other side of the wall, because it was only about a, you know three feet or a meter thick, you could see the, the uh, like seaweed and plants and stuff you know, that had been blown through it by the water. And then I looked up and I could see there was water in the distance too. So I was on this like peninsula. And then I woke up and I was like, wow, that was just super intense. And the dream stayed with me all day. So what happens? I go to the gym, I'm working out and I pulled something while I was working out. So my collarbone was bugging me a little bit and I was rubbing it and whatnot. I go to the uh, doctor that morning for an uh, injection in my ankle, a uh, cortisone thing. And I asked him, I said, I got a question for you. I said, if my ankle is bone on bone, and the, the, the source of the trauma is there. I said, why is the pain three or four inches up my leg? And he goes, oh, that's referral pain. Now, I know what referral pain is. It's like, you know, where, you know, for those, you know, I'm sure you probably know, but for people who don't know, referral pain is like if you get a shot in your arm, and I've had this happen, where your, your hand might hurt all of a sudden. You know, the needle is in your ear right by your elbow, but the pain is somewhere else. And so that's referral pain. So then I go, my next appointment was with an endodontist because the dentist had sent me for a 360 x-ray. He was concerned about one of my teeth uh, having a crack in it. And I get there and the guy looks at me and he goes, are you feeling any pain in that top tooth? And I said, not the top tooth, but the one immediately below it is sometimes sensitive to hot and cold. And he said, oh, that's referral pain. I'm like, why am I hearing about referral pain twice in one day? So I go back and at this point, my uh, collarbone wasn't bugging me anymore. Uh, but I had a, a late appointment with a client. I finished that about you know six o'clock. I'm walking up Grand Avenue in Chicago because I'm on my way to sh get shrimp tacos because I'm starving. And I get to the corner of Grand and Ogden in Chicago. And it sounds dramatic, but it's exactly what happened. This came back, the pain in my collarbone. And it wasn't pain. I mean, literally pain is a very too, much too strong word to describe it. It was just a, a slight cramp. Uh, but and had it not been for the dream, I would have ignored it completely. But I remember as soon as that came back, I'm thinking of the dream and thinking, okay, here's you know something that was there, it disappeared, came back, and I'm thinking of the lifeguard saying it's going to come back, you know, run for it basically. So I stopped and I silently asked, prayed, whatever you want to say. I said, do I need to get this checked out or can I go get shrimp tacos? And the and that was my exact question, and the answer came back immediately: you need to go get it checked out. So I go to the uh, urgent care. They hooked me up and they said, yeah, you're having a heart attack. You are, your heart's not getting enough oxygen. And what I came to find out was that the left wall of my heart, the artery on the left wall was 90% blocked. Well, that's exactly like the dream. Yeah. The wall to my left blocking 90% of the wave that crashed into it. 
Um, and it, I have a roommate from college who was an emergency room physician. And when I told him this story, he said, he goes, he goes, that's the widow maker. He said, you're, that dream saved your life. Uh, because I, I promise you, if I had not had the dream, I would have gone for shrimp tacos. I would have ignored this completely. And I would probably well, I've not heard be this right quite now. often, not only through prophetic dreams, but ayahuasca journeys, different meditative states, altered states, people will come into contact with a guide that lets them know, hey, you've got this going on. It may be told in a cryptic or mysterious way, but the message still comes through that there's something that you need to take care of, and it comes through in this altered state or dream state type experience. Isn't that amazing? I know people ask me because my dad had died not too long before that. And they're like, do you think it was your dad? And I said, yeah, he didn't run that fast. <laughs> right. Right. Well, tell yeah. us a little bit about your book, A Trek Within, and some of the topics that you touch on within it. So the book has every chapter is about you know, a different topic. And so you know, some of them are on dreams, uh, alternative medicine, past lives, uh, intuitives and intuition. And it was interesting when I first started to write it, it was never meant to be an autobiography because who needs to read that? But it was more about, uh, uh, you know, it's autobiographical in nature. But the editor that I worked with, and I love her for this, she said she was so intrigued. She was open to it. She'd never, she'd heard of it, but she never had that right door open that let her walk through to say, okay, I do believe in this. This is possible. And she said, do you know other people who've had these experiences? And I said, well, yeah. And she said, let's find other stories for the book. So now there's like 70 or 80 other stories in there. And there are, you know, for example, one of my favorite stories in the book uh, is my friend Marjorie. And Marjorie is somebody, she grew up in France in a small town and when one day she found uh, this uh, tapestry quilt thing or whatever that had been a, a kindergarten project. And what they did was they all, all the kids in the class did a self portrait and then they put the whole thing together on this quilt and she found it, her copy of it. She went to her mother and she said, where's Mathilde? And her mother said, there was no Mathilde in your class. And Marjorie's like, there absolutely was a Mathilde in the class. And then she went to the class picture and she pointed and she goes, that's Mathilde. And her mother goes, no, Marjorie, that's you. And that was when her, she pieced together what had happened. Marjorie's uh, mother had been pregnant with twins. And shortly before Marjorie was born, her mother had an accident and fell down. And one of the twins died. And so Marjorie survived. Now, the original plan was to name one of the twins Matilda, and I forget what the other twin was going to be called. Uh, but then what they ended up doing was they changed their plans completely and they named the remaining twin Marjorie. And so Marjorie in that moment found out that this Matilda, who was always in her dreams uh, and who was, you know, her friend growing up, was not actually anything other than the spirit. I I should say other than, but it was it was her twin sister who had died. Wow. Now you say you you wrote a bit about the afterlife and past lives, and I'd I'd love to get your thoughts into that. I have many different perspectives come through, and I take a very positive outlook that this what we're doing here is for our own experience and growth and consciousness evolution so that we can become the best cosmic entities possible. Some are unfortunately stuck in the mindset that this is a prison planet and we are being constantly recycled here just to have this negative energy siphoned from us. I love exploring all the different possibilities. Although I don't align with the more negative outlooks, I do enjoy having conversations and sharing my outlook with those people who have the negative outlooks, maybe so that they could get a different perspective and a different view of things. But I'd love to get your your insights into the afterlife, if we are being reincarnated, what we're doing here, if you have any thoughts on that. 
I do, yeah, and I love your openness to it uh, because, again, that this is falls firmly in the category of something I was not raised to believe it. I was raised Catholic, and you know, although you could argue the Catholic Church thousands of years ago did believe in reincarnation, they currently don't accept it. So, you know, again, not something that I was raised to believe, but I do. I do believe that because there were a couple of tenets that I talk about in the book that, you know, that I worked in where the perspective came from is important, too, because I for 34 years, I worked at the Children's Hospital in Chicago as a volunteer. And I started thinking to myself, it doesn't make OK, if God is love and I do believe there's a loving God, if God is love and that we you know, that we only have one chance at this. Um, and I forget there was a third one that um that uh, came to mind, but the, there were these three things that didn't really line up. And I'm like, how do you only have one chance at this if you only live a, a couple hours or a couple of days or a couple of weeks? It's not something a loving God would do. And so what I ended up reconciling was that, you know, there, there is a, a past life sort of component. And one of the kids that I worked with at the hospital, this was my very first spiritual experience, uh, literally came to say goodbye to me when she died. I felt like I had gotten this huge energetic hug. Um, and, you know, it was a Saturday afternoon in Chicago. It was this beautiful day. And all of a sudden, I had this amazing feeling. And I'm like, wow, she she just died today. And she was like 18 months old. And I had worked with her for a year. And, the, um, and then when I got to the hospital that Thursday, my supervisor looks at me and she said, we got some sad news. You know, so-and-so died this week. And I said, yeah, I know. I said, it happened on Saturday, didn't it? Um, and she goes, how did you know that? And I said, it was around three o'clock, wasn't it? She's like, how did you know that? And I was like, you know, and I, I don't know if I told her about that she'd come to say goodbye, but I literally felt like if I could not put words to it, I felt like she was saying, thank you for being my friend. Uh, now for her, I don't think she was here to learn any lessons. I think she was a teacher. Uh, I, you know, I think she certainly probably taught me compassion and I'm not egocentric enough to think that she was sent here to teach me. I think she was sent here to teach other people, probably her parents uh, and doctors and nurses. And I was a beneficiary of that. Um, now, in my own life, what I've realized is that, um, that you know, because sometimes people will say, well, you know, what good is, you know, finding out about a past life? What good is that going to do? Well, it can and, and that was like, for me, what was really powerful. There's a woman I went to named Therese Rowley, who is a, a really gifted intuitive, and she can tune into those sorts of energies. And one of the things that she was tuning in, she looked at me and she said, Rob, she said, you have a very elaborate way of stuffing your feelings. And she said, you know, she, her eyes were shut at the time. She said, it's really beautiful, but I don't get that it's working for you anymore. She said, do I have your permission to look into it and see where it came from? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So she looks into it and she uh, says, and it was funny when she did it. I'll never forget because she's like, she's got her eyes shut and she's blowing. And she's like, oh, oh, oh. And I'm like, what? You know, and so she goes, she goes, you had a past life as a soldier in a very terrible regime. And she said, you did not want to join the military, but your family was such that you had to. And so she said, what happened was you were uh, you basically said, I'm going to follow orders. I'll just do what they tell me to do. And that's it. She said, the problem is you were really good at following orders. So you got promoted and you became more and more responsible for a lot of things that were happening. And she said, when you died and look back on that lifetime, what you said was never again you were not happy about what you had done. And you said, I'm going to spend the rest of my lifetimes in service of humanity with no expectation of earthly reward. And I'm sitting at the time, I was literally spinning my wheels and not doing well at all financially. And I'm thinking, no wonder things are not gaining any traction, you know, if that's what was going on. And so she said, she's like, let's see if we can clear it. We got to figure out, is it a vow or was it an agreement that you made with yourself? It turned out it was a vow. It was a little bit more elaborate, but like we did it all in the one session. She wasn't one of these charlatans who's like, okay, well, you're going to need to buy these yeah. candles and, you know, we'll do the, it was like, let's do it all, clear it all out now. It's all part of the same thing. You know, there was no additional money charged, which is why I know that she's the real deal. Well, okay. So I'm feeling interesting about that, right? Well, my business started to take off after that. Now I could sit here and I would love to, you know, look at you and say, 
Chris, you know, here's the steps that I took and this is all me. <laughs> yeah. And, and right? I, I can't say that there was nothing I was doing different after that. And it was interesting because a week later I had this unbelievable, I, this was the other telepathic dream. Uh, this, I had gone to bed and this being uh, is shows up. And it's so funny because usually when I dream about like my house, it's my house, but it's not really my house. It's really different. This was, I was in my house, same night that I had gone to bed. Nothing was different. And there was somebody outside the door. And when I opened the door, this being like rushes in. And then the next thing I know, we're standing in the living room. He's on the opposite side by this like French patio door. And I'm standing on the stairs by the kitchen looking at him, you know, from about 20 feet away. And he telepathically communicates to me. I am that part of you responsible for stuffing your feelings. You cannot let me go. Okay. I'm completely <laughs> taken aback at this point. And I'm like, wow. whoa. And so I paused and I said, and I don't know exactly where it came from, but it would probably, you know, some of the spiritual stuff and, you know, that I've been dealing with. And I, I looked at him and I said, thank you. I said, you were there for me at a time where I really needed you and you were very helpful. I do not need you anymore. It's time for you to go. And I, uh, you know, made it clear, turned around. Next thing I know, he's standing outside the door and it was wild. He was wearing this like black trench coat and a hat. And he had this very sharp jaw, kind of like a Dick Tracy, which is wild because I never really read cartoons, but I recognized it immediately. And then he got led away by this little dog. And when I was telling Therese about the dream later, there was another woman listening. And I said, I get everything about that except for the, the you know, the dog. And this woman, and Therese is like, yeah, I'm not sure about that either. And then this woman looks up and she goes, I have an idea about that. And we're like, you do? And she goes, yeah. She goes, when you didn't agree to host that being anymore, it needed to get a let, it needed to get led away by something. And a dog represents unconditional love. That's what took it away. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, and literally that was in so past lives, do I believe in it? hundred percent. And interestingly, the very first song that I ever learned how to play on guitar, one of them was a song called The Ballad of Joseph Schultz by this amazing songwriter named Dave Crossland. And that song is about a Nazi soldier who, uh, you know, his friend, uh, the one didn't follow orders and was killed and his friend did. And in the last line of the song is I was only following orders, Joe, you should have done the same. And it's just, but it, and it's the most intense acoustic guitar song I think I've ever heard. And I didn't know this was long before the dream or my session with Therese. And also, you know, my dad was in the military. He was, he loved the air force on his deathbed. You know, his, one of his last moments where he was not quite there he asked my mom, he said, am I back on active duty? That was like the happiest time in his, in his life. When I was 17, I was going, please, no, I do not want to be drafted. I was terrified of that. I was, I was born on an Air Force mm. base. You know, but there, I knew from an early age I wanted nothing to do with the military. Mm. Um, and, and so you can't tell me that that's not all connected. Right. Now, you said something very interesting that I've been looking into, and that is regarding this entity this shadow hat man entity that represented the emotional baggage that you really didn't want to let go of and this is fascinating to me this may be the answer to a lot of what we understand as quote unquote contact experiences is these thought forms or archetypes that are part of our consciousness that are guiding us and communicating with us that if we're going down the wrong path or a bad path may appear as a monster or a demon. But once we start to become aware of this and work with it in certain ways, it can transmute into something beautiful and really benefit you in your life. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And I do believe that like, even in a dream, you can begin to control some of that. So like if you're having, I used to have these diving dreams. So I was a springboard diver in high school. And the uh, and the and the boards would do these weird things where in the dreams where I could almost never get off the diving board because it would either be at an angle that would send me to the shallow end of the pool or there'd be people in the way. And it was very frustrating. And this psychologist I had gone to at the time, this is a long time ago, he said, he goes, next time that happens, he goes, ask the diving board why it won't let you go off the board. <laughs> And I'm like, am I going to remember to do that in the dream? He said, trust yourself. You will remember. Now, the interesting thing and something that I didn't know at the time, but I learned later, I, I took his advice and I said, why won't you let me go off the board? 
And in that moment, the board literally got shark teeth on it. And, and then the pool got really dark and I was never scared, but there was like fire in the water. Next thing I know, I'm in the water. And then I like woke up immediately. But what I realized I had done wrong in that, and this is what, you know, the power of words again, if you ask a why question, that is unbelievably confrontational. Like if I look at you and I say, why did you do that? You know, I might be thinking, Chris, that's the most brilliant thing I've ever seen in my life, but that's not what you heard. What you heard probably is me questioning your mm. judgment. And for me to, you know, you know, th those entities, I do believe, you know, they have a gift or an insight or whatever to share with us if we're open to it. Confronting them in an unhelpful way is not going to get mm. there. And so, you know, I wish I had known what I know now because I don't have those dreams very often anymore. But if I had it to do over again, I might, you know, I would approach it very differently. I would be more like I was with the being and start out acknowledging and say, you know, you know, thank you for, it seems like you're trying to give me a message here. What is it? You know, and even if something's chasing you to turn around and, and not run away from it, but to, you know, just be open. I mean, you're in a dream. It's not like you're going to die, you know, um, and, and to, to be open and say, you know, what is, what are you trying to show me? What, you know, help me see what you need me to know. Uh, easier said than done for sure. Uh, but I do think there's validity. Yeah. That. And I know exactly what you mean because I experienced this through my own consciousness exploration with plant medicines. And it's very it's similar to confronting these archetypes in a dream because it can be very terrifying. But if you, if you show no fear and you learn from the experience and embrace it, it becomes something beautiful and healing for you. Absolutely. You had mentioned plant stuff. If you, if you haven't already uh, read Tom Brown Jr.'s awa uh, book, Awakening Spirits. Uh, he was taught by a native American uh, lip and Apache who had never lived in civilization. And so he learned all about edible and medicinal plants and being a shaman and all that stuff. And it's a it's an amazing spiritual journey uh, from a Native American point of view. It's really cool. Right on. I'm have to check that out. Now, you mentioned that you also shared other people's stories in your book, uh, inspirational stories. Maybe you could tell us a couple before we go some of the most inspiring stories uh from your book a little bit about some of them sure the one of the ones that i ended with uh was my friend Kristen from high school and i loved i wish i could remember exactly how she phrased it but you know the the whole idea of you know there are a lot of signposts that are only avail um only available or only visible in hindsight you know we look back and then we realize oh now i get what's going on and in her case when she was in high school, I vividly remember I went down to Northwestern Memorial Hospital to visit her in the hospital. She'd had knee surgery. Now, at the time in 1984 or 85, knee surgery meant you're, she was literally in traction with her leg up in a machine that was moving her leg back and forth physically so she couldn't even sleep. That same operation would probably be done arthroscopically today and she would have walked out. But in that era, she didn't. And she ended up in uh special education gym because in high school you got to go to gym class every day well if you're in a cash you can't do that and so she was very frustrated she's like i'm gonna i'm a i think she's a lacrosse star she's like i'm an athlete i don't belong with all the physical and mentally challenged people in the high school this is not you know she was very frustrated at the beginning but eventually she spent so much time there she began to become friends with a lot of the you know the people who were mentally challenged and that led to her volunteering with, uh, um, uh, I can't think of the group, uh, Special Olympics, uh, and just being an advocate and whatnot. Well, fast forward uh, to, to later on, she gets married and she has a child who has Angelman syndrome. And Angelman syndrome, as I understand, it's a pretty serious condition. And I believe it's on the autism spectrum. And she has become an advocate because what she realized was, you know, we went to Nutra High School outside of Chicago. There's 4,400 people in that high school. We didn't see with any, you know, frequency any of the people who were mentally and physically challenged. There was like, I don't know if they were in a different building or what, but like, we just didn't really cross paths with them. And her point was, they need to be integrated. These are real people. And so, and, and one of the beautiful things that came out of her work is her son, uh, you know, is, I believe he's nonverbal. And he doesn't really do a lot of reading, uh, but he loves to be read to. 
Well, in the class that she got him to be part of the regular class, not the, you know, a special education class, there was a child in that class who he needs help reading out loud and enunciating and he needs practice. So they put the two together. You know, what a beautiful thing, you know, here's where the, those two can now, you know, learn from each other and it's integrated and there's no fear or anything around that. And she's been really instrumental in that. And and I don't know that any of that would have happened had she not gone through a lot of what she went through and seeing what she saw and realizing that, you know, the way that we were doing that before was not right. Um, and, and I do believe that the universe works in just really amazing in wonderful ways. And, you know, is there, you know, sometimes people get really upset when you say, you know, everything happens for a reason. My personal belief is that it does, but I, I totally respect people who say, I don't believe that, you know, why did my family die in a fire or blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to sit there and say, you know, somebody who went through some horrible tragedy, I'm not going to look at them and be like, oh, well, you know, look for the gift in that. Cause they're rightly going to be like, screw you, dude. Uh, but, you know, and, and so maybe that isn't true for everything. But if you are ready and you are in a place to look back and say, or even at your current situation and say, what is the gift in what I'm dealing with right now? What lesson am I supposed to be learning that's going to keep me from having to relearn and relearn and go through the same struggles with different people? Uh, you know, those are those are the things that make life richer. And that's that's really what I wrote the book about, because it isn't about, um, you know, I'm not trying to start a new religion. I don't care. I'm not going to miss a meal if nobody you know believes what I had to say. All my intention was to, to speak to that group that is on the cusp of not really necessarily believing, but being open to it. Do you believe that we have soul contracts or agreements of a basic path that we are going to take in this life? Yes, I do. And I think there's still though, even within that, I do believe there's, you know, freedom of choice and things like that. The best analogy for that, and I can't take credit for this. I wish I remember where I heard it. Uh, but the best analogy was along the lines of uh, it's like a Pac-Man game or a uh, or Pac-Man is not the right uh, uh, with Super Mario yeah. Brothers, where when you start to play Super Mario Brothers, you know, you can take him in any given direction. You can go backwards. You can stand still. You can do whatever. Every, but every eventuality of that game has already been programmed in. It's just a question of him doing or you doing on his behalf whatever you want him to do. Uh, everything, nothing, you know, half, whatever. Uh, and I love that analogy because... Yeah, there's infinite possibilities. And there's, you know, and, and Tom Brown talks about this too. He talks about possible and probable futures. You know, and as a planet, we're right there right now. You know, the 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 possible future is that we're destroying it completely. Um, I hope that's not the probable future, uh, but it's certainly a possible future. Um, and you know, there's but we we can shift that if we get our act together. Well, speaking of, I, I love to get your thoughts on where we are collectively. This is a tough one to decipher because of the echo chambers that we're in, especially in our technological age and the amount of censorship that we have to deal with. Algorithms are going to dictate a lot of who is going to hear what we're talking about and when and how. So... It's difficult for me to decipher at times how many people are really having a spiritual awakening and becoming aware of the fundamental problems with our ruling class and society and medical industry and things that a lot of people that are in my immediate life and that I communicate with are becoming aware of. But it's hard to gauge a bigger picture outside of that, especially if you're not traveling around the world talking to people in person every day. So I'd love to, to get your thoughts on where we're at collectively if, we, if you have hope that we are becoming more aware and we won't destroy ourselves eventually. Yeah, I do have hope that we're becoming more aware. Now, a big part of that is, in my opinion, we need to – be really careful about what we believe and from whom. And so the biggest threat along those lines is I think about disclosure and, you know, what's going on with UAP sightings and things like that. I'm a big fan of Stephen Greer. 
um, you know, who's been an advocate of, you know, I, first of all, I think anybody who can look themselves in the mirror and say we're alone in this gigantic universe is naive. Uh, you know, the odds of that are infinitesimally small. Now, there's people like, well, then why haven't we seen him? Well, there's a lot of evidence that we have, uh, tons, in fact, you know, but people choose not to believe it. But the, the scary part of that for me and why it all factors into the collective is because I do believe in Stephen's premise that uh, or Dr. Greer's premise, rather, that, you know, the government may well use a uh, an alien type encounter as a way to inspire fear. Uh, which is not the case. I don't see, there's a real spiritual alien connection in my mind. There's a book by Bledsoe. I can't even think of what the name of the UFO book was. UFO of God? He talked about UFO Pardon? of God? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I like that concept of, you know, that there was a, an absolute spiritual component. And I do believe, okay, anybody who's got the advanced technology to be able to get here and remain somewhat undetected uh, could do whatever they want with us. We are their ant farm. And, you know, if they want to use a magnifying glass and, you know, burn us up, they could certainly do that. Right. Um, but they're not doing that. I firmly believe that they are here to help um, and to study and to learn why this is the most violent planet in the universe. Uh, and so, you know, we can learn from that or we can be afraid of it. But if they use it, if the government chooses to use it as a false flag event, to, you know, use the military industrial machine to, you know, ramp that up and, you know, try to blow things up and attack each other, then, you know, we need to really take a good hard look and say, realize that we're probably being lied to. Yeah, I'd like to think it's all an evolutionary process to help us realize that we can rely on ourselves. We don't have to rely on daddy government. We don't have to rely on invisible boogeymen in the sky or dogma or the possibility of eternal punishment or eternal life to be good people. We can just be good people because that's the way we should be. And possibly this what this is all about is getting us to become aware that we can rely on ourselves if we get to that evolutionary state. Oh, totally. You know, it's interesting to me because I've been very involved in the couch surfing community. And over the last 10 years, I've hosted almost a thousand people from 70 some different countries. And I've realized that the vast majority of the people on this planet are nice people. They're good people, you know, which is why one of the reasons I never had any interest in joining the military. Why would I want to go blow up some good person's house just because some idiot, you know, thinks that's a good idea, you know? That it's, you know, are there bad people in the world? For sure. I'm not pretending naively that there aren't. There absolutely are. But to your point, I think most people really are good people. And there's there's an opportunity to, uh, uh, you know, to learn and to embrace and realize that, you know, it's not a cliche to say we are all one and we are all connected and we are we have a responsibility. You know, it's, you know, the Native Americans who talk about, you know, the uh, you're, you know, what, what are we doing for our grandchildren's grandchildren in terms, you know, we're the stewards of the planet for them. And we're not, you know, hell, we can't even manage our budget, let alone the planet. Right. hundred percent. Rob, this was fantastic. Great information. Is there anything, any closing words you'd like to leave the audience with before we close it out today? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. This is an absolute pleasure. Really, really enjoyed it. And I would love to hear more at some point, you know, about your, you know, you talked about plants and stuff like that. There's an enormous amount I know I can learn from you. Uh, and we'll continue to watch your podcast to, to find that. Uh, if people are interested in the book, uh, a trekwithin.com, you can download a free chapter, uh, either audio or PDF, uh, and just check it out and see if it's for you before you make any sort of commitment uh, to it. Uh, because, you know, that's uh, something I firmly believe in. You should be able to sample and check things out. Uh, but if you're if you made it this far uh, on behalf of Chris and myself, thank you, because it's uh, we appreciate it. Excellent. That. Yes, this is such essential information right now, Rob. Thank you so much. Definitely love to talk more in the future. Much more we can discuss. And until next time, everyone, have a wonderful evening. We'll talk again tomorrow. See y'all then. Hello friends, are you struggling to lose weight and keep it off? Have you tried intermittent fasting, low-carb or ketogenic diets, 
cutting calories and exercising more with no success? Book a free intro call with my friend Christian Yordanoff to see how he can help you. He is a health author and functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. He was on the show recently to discuss his latest book on longevity, How to Actually Live Longer, Volume 1. He understands that for many people, excess weight gain and weight loss resistance is much more complex than calories in, calories out. You may be having a hard time shedding the pounds because of hormonal and metabolic imbalances that won't respond to simply eating less and moving more. In our modern environment full of obesogenic chemicals and endocrine disruptors, xenoestrogens and persistent organic pollutants, as well as unprecedented levels of stress, A more sophisticated approach is needed to help people like yourself achieve long-lasting results. Christian's going to help you lose weight in a safe, sustainable, and stress-free manner. He doesn't use severe calorie restriction, low-carb or ketogenic diets, intermittent or water fasting, or intense exercise regimens with his clients. Instead, his focus is on improving diet quality, addressing hormonal and metabolic imbalances, reducing stress, and helping you build the habits and lifestyle that will allow you to achieve your body composition goals and transform your health. In addition, he's going to help you boost your detoxification system because this is critical to get right before you start losing a significant amount of weight. Christian will help you get healthy to lose weight That is the right way to do it. This is not a quick fix, but a comprehensive strategy that will help you achieve your desired body composition in a safe, free, and stress-free manner. If you are done with the fat diets and intermittent starvation and are ready for real solutions, the support you need is available. Click that link in the description to learn more and book your free call with Christian to see how he can help you. Make sure you mention FKN when booking, and he will add extra free consultation sessions to your package.